what I find disturbing in our community, the African American community, is that we can talk about a thyroid, we can talk about cancer, breast cancer, AIDS even, but we won't deal with the mental. And that's an issue. I struggle with depression and anxiety. I would have to say I realized it about two years ago. I noticed um, the mood swings, like, you know, one day I'd be up and the next day I'd be down, feeling like I don't want to go out in public, almost agoraphobic, like, ugh, too much to deal with, uh, feeling really awkward in my skin, feeling out of sorts, you know, and just down, like Debbie Downer, like a dark cloud. <laughs> and then there would be days where my brain wouldn't stop racing, which would I would think of the most worst scenarios in the world, <laughs> which would heighten my anxiety. And, you know, people were like, you just need to meditate and yoga and things like that. And I would do that, but my brain would still race. For me, there was no shame when I started to recognize it. Um, it was like that I have to get some help because I'm the, I'm the life of the party. And when I go dark, I go dark. I don't want to leave the house. And my friends started to notice me pulling back. And my father, who also had his issues with mental health, was really open about it, um, about his manic depression. But, you know, as I think back, no one else really talked about it. It was hush hush, or you know, he just crazy, or you know, things like that. For my dad, what he needed was a culturally competent therapist. And, and it's not even about the skin color or the race, it's about being culturally competent. And the reason why we can't find culturally competent therapists is because at home, in the African American community, we don't talk about mental health. You know, it's, it's a stigma surrounding it. And when you have no one to talk to, what a person usually do is they will try to self-medicate. We're just not allowed to be vulnerable. We have to be strong. Uh, all the time. This is 400 years of damage, 400 years of trauma that we have not dealt with. And the way we deal with it is be strong, put on a strong face, nothing's wrong with you, you don't have mental health, you're not gay, don't, you know, you're not allowed to be human. That's a lie. <laughs> we hurt and we're suffering. When you think about the trauma the African American community has been through since we've been brought to this country, we have not dealt with that. And then you get to these microaggressions that are happening right in front of our faces every day on television. Women's sons are being taken from them for no reason at all. And through that, we still have to be strong? How fucking dare you? How dare you? How dare you put that on me? I felt pressure to be strong as a black woman in Hollywood because I kept hearing that term. Everyone kept saying, be a strong black woman, strong black woman. Then I realized, that's a myth. <laughs> it means that I'm some superhuman in some kind of way where nothing affects me and that is so far from the truth. Sometimes I don't wanna be strong. Sometimes the weight is just too much, you know? And to put on that facade like you're strong all the time, is this exactly what it is, a facade. That's, that's, that's whack. You have to be human. And human means you're vulnerable. And human means you're, you're layered. And you know, being in an industry where you know, you're getting paid 52 cents on the dollar compared to a white male, things like that weigh on your soul. You know, because I'm an artist and I'm an artist to the bone. So when I work, I give you all of me. And to know that all of me is only worth 52 cents on the dollar of what he's getting paid, that hurts. A lot of that stuff started weighing on me and sort of like dimming my light. And I had to just get control of it. And you know, what I started to do was started making me feel good about it is not keeping it in and talking about it, you know? Um, because if you talk, maybe things will get fixed. I felt so, such a relief when I finally said it publicly. Like, I suffer from this. People just, it was an outpour. You know, as an outpour, people, it was like they were like this, and all of a sudden they felt free to, to speak on it. When I, I got back above water, when I stopped suffocating myself, I was drowning. And once I released my truth, once I spoke my truth, I started to float back. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. It's luggage, it's baggage, and, and, and it will weigh you down. You better un to pop those trunks and get that mess out and deal with it. It's okay, we're human, no one's perfect. They're, the perfection is the perfect lie. When my therapist said that, my wings sprouted. <laughs>
the pressure of trying to be something perfect which doesn't exist is crazy. Let go of that myth. When, when I'm vulnerable, I'm scared, or I'm having these um, non-pleasant thoughts, I let it run. Because if you, if you muffle it, it's only gonna resurface again. So you have to kind of let it run and play out like a, like a faucet. Just let it run until the water runs out. And then when it's, oh, you pick yourself back up. Because you know, your mind will play tricks on you. I talk to myself. And I think more people need to talk to themselves because you work things out. And it's not, you know, people can call it crazy, whatever. I even catch myself doing it in public and I have to stop. But um, it's, it's just a way to work things out. Um, and you, it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I will have a full on conversation with myself in the mirror. When you have issues and you have no one to talk to and the, the walls are closing in, and the voices are getting too loud, what I notice is that people, people will start to self-medicate because you want to feel good, right? So then they turn to alcohol, they turn to drugs, and we're seeing this with the youth a lot. I'm a celebrity, and at this point, everybody kept asking me, do you have a charity? And I really couldn't find anything that I was passionate about, and then I was like, this is it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because this is something I'm really passionate about. This is something that is a necessity for me. And um, I said, we have to break this cycle of keeping our mouths closed. So I called my best friend who also has a lifetime of suffering with anxiety and um, that's when we decided to birth the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation named after my father. So I think he'd be really proud. <laughs> I felt such an urgency to do something. I felt like it was my mission to give back to these children because they're having coping issues. And so our, our um, my foundation is what we're trying to do is we're trying to get these babies while they're kids. So we infiltrate the school, we get counselors in there who can see a child dealing with tra a traumatic situation at home. Because these kids come to school from trauma, from traumatic situations at home, and we expect them to learn and sit down and focus. I'm speaking up now because we are facing a national crisis. I want people to know.